and welcome to Fintech Insider Insights. I'm Laura Watkins, Director of Media and Marketing at 11FS. In this episode, we are discussing wealth. Whether you want it, you have it, you inherit it, wealth affects us all. But as we're recording this just after International Women's Day, we want to zoom in on how the wealth space is serving women. Women have been traditionally underserved in this space, but as wealth management solutions move into the digital world, we want to know what opportunities this creates to provide effective and appropriate tools to support women through all stages of their wealth journey. So we're going to look at how the current landscape shakes up, the challenges this creates, and what is being done to address this. Firstly, joining me today is Nadine Timmer-Bodestein, Ventures Product Lead at 11FS. Welcome back to the podcast, Nadine, all the way from South Africa. Very exciting. What have you been working on recently, apart from enjoying the sunshine? <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Uh, well, quite quite topical, actually. I'm currently working on a project focused on the wealth management industry. So delighted to be here today to discuss that in detail and, and specifically the role of females in that industry. Exciting. And we are also delighted to welcome to the conversation Laura Pomfret, co-founder at Financial. Great to have you with us, Laura. For the listeners who don't know, please tell us more about you and what you do. Oh, I'd love to. So yeah, I co-founded Fanishel, um a couple of years ago now with actually my sister, Holly Holland. And Fanishel helps women globally take back control of their money. It takes them on a money journey right from the very beginning where um, you know, you, you're trying to work out how to take control and all the way up to you know, wealth, wealth management and, and leaving a lovely legacy. Amazing. So you are the best person to have this conversation with today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, let's dive right in, shall we? Uh, I think it's important to start by looking at the wider wealth landscape, what it looks like, where the gaps are in the current system when it comes to adequately meeting the needs of women. Uh, so Nadine, let's start with you. What does the current landscape look like at the moment? If you just give us an overview and, and maybe let the listeners know where the kind of pitfalls are for, for women in this space. Yeah, of course. I think it's probably quite useful to paint a bit of a picture around the players in the wealth management landscape, you know, in incumbents versus fintechs and how historically and, and more recently they're trying to address these needs differently. So I suppose on the one hand, we've got our kind of large incumbents, you know, the likes of UBS, Coots, Investec, etc., who offer that full advisory service. You know, their service is very much defined by kind of high touch, high touch points, human centric, personalized service, but at the same time, very much founded on that legacy tech architecture. On the other end of the spectrum, we've kind of got, you know, fintechs who are emerging and who are building these modern digital platforms to either offer direct investing or some kind of basic guidance and, and perhaps starting to move into more of the hybrid advice space, you know, the likes of Revolut, Free Trade, Wealthify, Plum, etc. So as a whole, you know, really, a really rich, rich landscape. But I think one of the key points, and we'll obviously dig into it in, in a lot more detail today, is that, you know, the wealth management industry was founded by men for men. Historically, finances in the household were controlled by men. And, and it's, you know, not just wealth management across the entire financial landscape. So services have very much been targeted to, to that demographic. But now we're seeing a emergence of, of the female investor driven by a number, a number of different factors that I think we'll get into a lot more detail in today's session as well. But I think it would be remiss not to, not to touch at this point on that great wealth transfer. You know, we, we did a podcast, a couple of weeks ago that that focused in on that in detail. So I, I won't I won't focus too much on it, but just to remind everyone that, you know, this great wealth transfer is underway. It's the transfer of wealth from those baby boomers to first actually, you know, boomer wives because they tend to live longer than their husbands. So they're kind of, you know, those first lots of, of females who are actually going to be inheriting that that wealth from from their boomer husbands. And then passing from the wives down, down to the children. And interestingly, you know, female millennials are disproportionately impacted by this wealth transfer. So hugely topical, you know, these incumbents as well as fintechs that, that we mentioned earlier are starting now to think about how to better serve women in this new environment that we find ourselves in. But like you, like you touched on Laura, there are many 
pitfalls that currently exist. And I think it all leads back to the fact that women are different to men and women want to be served differently to men. Um, and, and that really is kind of the, the key point that I'm sure we will dig into today in more detail. Absolutely. Thank you for that, for that overview. And yeah, we were talking before this podcast about that uh, sort of imbalance in the great wealth transfer. I didn't, I didn't realize it was quite so disproportionately going to a, to female recipients. So yeah, there's never been a a sort of more timely conversation, uh, time to have this conversation. Um, Laura, in your experience, uh, what was, what would you add to that? What are the sort of the pitfalls and the ways in which the current sort of normal way of serving a sort of high net worth individuals is not really fit for purpose for women? I think it's from a very archaic time. I think, you know, apart from the challenger banks in terms of, you know, the Monza and the Starling and the Revoluts and they're the household names that you see, personal finance is still very much been the same way for such a long time. Even the language it uses, you know, a financial we're passionate about, we speak to our customers, if not daily, weekly and record them and we listen to them and you know what they never use the f word like finance they might use the other f word more than they use the word finance but that's just not normal people speak as i call it we don't say i must look after my finances we talk about money and and we also talk about life and life events and life triggers and they're very different those life triggers and, and and life experiences differ between genders they really really do and so when the language that's used is finance or even wealth it's very um can be intimidating to some, it can feel out of reach for others. And so, so many um, people just don't think it's for them or they feel intimidated by it. And so um, when you combine that with some of what Nadine just said with like the, you know, built by men for men, and in fact, in senior positions in finance are still dominated by men. When we're looking at products, whether we like it or not, most companies don't get close to the customer, they build what they want to build. And they build it from their own life experiences. You know, that's that's the wrong way around to do it, but it's how a lot of things get passed as projects and kind of the okay at board level. And so whether it's, you know, people around that table not thinking about longevity and how long men versus women are going to live, care needs as people get older, and the, the gender pay gaps and the maternity um, gaps that have happened and then may continue to happen, divorces that then happen and the disproportionate split of wealth because of pensions. It's just not in the mind of the product builders and and you know innovation is just welcomed in that space because as as long as it stays stuck in the old ways it only benefits the people it's always benefited and just to jump in there laura um i think i think the point you just mentioned around the language is is such an important one actually and, and like you said you know it's not finance it's not wealth it's money it's life stage it's it's life events i think it's such an important point and it links back to, to something else that has come up time and time again in, in our research on this topic, which is around how, you know, women take much more of a goal-based approach to their money. You know, they want to focus on actually, well, even if I'm thinking of my money now or thinking of it in five years time or 10 years time, how do I actually plan to link to the different milestones in my life or the goals that I'm working towards and you know your your discussion there around also the terminology that is used I think is is so important because if we're thinking ahead to perhaps you know financial advisors or banks or wealth managers who are wanting to target women and are wanting to have those conversations with them that's going to be integral to it you know how do they talk to them in a way that actually not only makes them feel comfortable, but increases their confidence in that, you know, actually this is the person I want to help me with my financial plan or entrust with, with some of my money to invest in, et cetera. And it's, it's the nuance, but I think it's often quite overlooked and actually addressing that, that jargon and perhaps even just how language is, is tailored to a certain demographic is, is such an important point in all of this. It's, it's really important. And, you know, it's, it, people also get it wrong and think it's dumbing down or oversimplifying as if there's a difference between, you know, men and women's comprehension, whilst there is actually a financial literacy gap between the, between the sexes. Actually, it's about relev- it's relevance. And so it's so important to use language that makes it relevant, especially when, as a big thing for the fintechs listening, you know, you have competed for attention in the social space now. So from, you know, even, um, you know, older than millennial, we are finding things from social. That's where we consume our content. It's where we learn things. You know, people say, 
I, I read and it's like, well, did you watch it on TikTok? Is that how you found out about this, like, you know, latest, latest development in, in um, pop culture? That's where people are and you, you're fighting for attention alongside health and fitness guidance and recipes and relationship advice. And that's where we have to get people's attention, but not do it in a way that makes it feel accessible and relevant to them. So yeah, great point, Nadine. Yeah, I totally agree. I think, you know, you've got to, you want to build products and services for the right people, but in a part, building them isn't enough, right? And talking to people in the right way and making them feel actually welcome into the space you're creating is is, is you know, half the battle as well. Um, I want to go back to the point that you kind of touched on earlier about the sort of particular goals or milestones that, that are sort of pertinent to women or how sort of women typically uh, view their finances or financial planning. What would be a kind of common example of those milestones um, and you know, how are they not currently being supported by the products on the on the market? Absolutely. I think the the first kind of insight I want to give, which is perhaps slightly nuanced and, and not necessarily directly answering your question, but I think it's important for the for the kind of wider context, is um one of the fintechs that I follow with um great enthusiasm is Elvest. It's a US based fintech focused on yeah empowering women through giving them back control of of their of their money. And they recently released a report that kind of focused on some of the research that they had done recently. And one of the key points that they spoke about was around money confidence and actually the money confidence gap. And Specifically, what is relevant in the money confidence gap is how inextricably linked money confidence is to the gender wealth gap. And their key insight was that, and it actually relates back to the great wealth transfer that we touched on earlier, that there's basically a fundamental shift that occurs when women receive a financial kind of windfall, you know, if that's an inheritance or a bonus or something, you know, they kind of receive this, this chunk of money. And what happens is that their money confidence improves. And I think it's really important because actually one of the key issues in this is actually that, you know, we know that there are disparities between female income versus male income. I think, I think the stats that I read earlier today in a, in a boring money report is that kind of the average income for women in the UK is about £24,000 and for men it's £32,000. So already, you know, women are kind of starting at a different point to men. It means that their money confidence is, is not as good as men. And now we know through the LVEST research that actually when they receive that windfall, their money confidence increases. So that's all to say that actually that in itself is a milestone. You know, if women inherit money in whatever format it may be, that immediately changes their psychology and that's a really key moment that financial service providers could capitalize on to say, okay, well, actually, we know that now these ladies are more confident in their money. This is a chance that we can actually help them to plan for the future, plan plan for the goals that they want. Um, but I suppose, circling back to, to your original point around, well, what are some of those goals? What are some of those milestones? I, I think they are, you know, I, I don't necessarily think, and, and Laura, I'm not sure if you agree with this, I don't necessarily think that the actual specific goals and milestones are necessarily that different across genders. I think it's more that actually women perhaps think about them differently and they want to have more of a plan around a care would like to, you know, all the, all the ones that we would expect buy my first house, pay down any debt I have, whether that's student loans or other debts, plan for, you know, my first child, plan for the future, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's very much just understanding those goals, but on a deeper level, you know, we speak about customer jobs to be done in all of the work that we do at 11FS and it's, well, actually, is it buying that first house or is it creating a home that is going to store the memories for your family in the future? So kind of again goes back to what we were just talking about around terminology and you know getting that level deeper not just not just kind of sitting at that surface level but really truly understanding your clients on on that deeper level so you can work together with them to to help them achieve those goals yeah I mean like you know women are not a homogenous bunch but generally we find with the planners like when we're speaking to customers you know maybe the woman's jumping on right move a little before you know, their partner is, or, you know, they're, they're already 
they are also in control of 85% of the world's spending. So those spending decisions in the household are made by um, typically a female. So whether that's, you know, what's, what brands are bought on the big shop, where you're going to go on holiday, what's going to be bought for Christmas, all, you know, lots of spending decisions and planning decisions are typically made um, made by the woman. And so when you find that, it, it's just interesting then when it comes to um, planning and where things land in the order of life. And I guess the, the, the next point that's really, really important that people don't really think about is the overwhelm of that. So the overwhelm of the lots of different goals that you're managing. And if you overlay onto that, what you just said, Nadine, about women already being behind. So if you, you know, you've got two, two side by side, um, man and woman, the woman already gets less because of the gender pay gap. And then she's also targeted um, aggressively by marketing, um, consumer marketing to spend and to make sure that she feels aesthetic. You know, two different Instagram feeds, male and female, will be very, very different. You know, one, the male may be targeted with investing and sports and um, cooking. And again, I'm, I'm absolutely generalizing, but the woman will absolutely be targeted with spend, 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 buy this, you'll look better, you'll feel better, you'll feel younger. And so there's no right, right or wrong, but when you, when you bring all of that together and then you expect a woman to feel comfortable and have that money confidence to invest, she's got a lot more at stake. She's got a lot more to lose. You know, she's got, she, she needs a bigger part and she's got less money to build it with. And, uh, and it, what's interesting is the, the earlier, obviously, as we all know with compound inter interest and just your investing muscle, the earlier you can get a woman to do it or anyone to do it, the better. But earlier there's just a lot more goals floating around and I feel like it's providers you know incumbents or challenges bearing that in mind and that's what I think we do really well we go right to the beginning and go okay well what has this person got on in their head the life admin the choices the things they should do the things they want to do the best practice the impulsivity and how do we build a plan that lets them feel like they can enjoy today, feel like they can enjoy next month, but also know that in 50 years' time, they're absolutely sorted as well. And if we're talking about like the, I mean, we're talking about the wealth space, which normally means we're talking about the wealthy as well. Um, you know, those who are already have money or are about to come into it in some way. How, does that approach change or do the goals and sort of outgoings and things that they have to keep track of just get more complicated? Um, Laura, if you start us off there. Well, so we have, you know, a very wide spectrum of users that use financial. We have people, I had a call today, um, someone on Universal Credit trying to manage getting to the end of the month with enough money. And then there's, you know, there's other people in their 40s and 50s who are planning for a really, really good retirement, actually. They still find it overwhelming, though. It's really interesting. There's lots of other competing um, elements at play for them but actually there's a segment of you know um, high net worth individuals who have a real issue with trust in the wealth management industry so it, nowadays you know I'm not giving so I'm not giving credit to women in years gone by but more and more you demand better from your service provider and if you are already wealthy or if you've had a um, you know a, a wealth event a divorce an inheritance then actually you want to speak to someone that you can trust or, or buy from a brand that you can trust. And a lot of them, the feedback we get is they just, they don't see someone like them. They see, you know, typically a middle-aged white man the other side and they might be spoken to in a particular way that doesn't make them feel comfortable. And, and I've seen this time and time again, and I cannot understand why there are, the industry gets it wrong now. So many people do get it right. And there's some amazing, amazing, you know, um, actual planners, but they, there's this uncertainty around people that have the wealth that wants it organized in a way that suits their needs now, helps out people, gives, and they just don't get the service they want. Yeah, I think, Nadia, we've talked about that before, right? People who come into money often immediately move away from the provider that was providing or the services to the person who they maybe inherited from or something. Um, can, you, can you tell us more about why that might be? Yeah, absolutely. We, it's actually, also very topical, we've been doing quite a lot of research internally on the kind of financial advice space specifically. Um, there are just some quite interesting, I suppose, demographic factors at play there as well. So, so like you touched on, Laura, you know, the reality is the majority of financial advisors or wealth managers are male. Interestingly, and, and, and perhaps you didn't know this, but 76% of them plan to retire in the next decade. So it's, you know, kind of a 
older male dominated industry as it is um we've also found that i think it's something like only five percent or so of the financial advisors wealth managers that we've spoken with actually have a specific strategy in place to target female clients to kind of bring in those you know next generation clients as as they refer to them and the the stat that laura was referring to is that over 80 percent of beneficiaries do end up switching away from you know perhaps the original family advisor for a lot of those factors that that you just touched on you know they feel like actually the advisors are not prepared to serve them in the way that they want to be served given their priorities given their much more confident use of technology Um, and I think the key point there is around what we've seen is you know these this new demographic of investors they they seek that kind of reassurance or guidance from an advisor but at the same time they they are quite independent and they want to be kept updated you know that's quite in contrast to let's say a lot of the baby boomer wealthy people who we've spoken to who are much more you know I've got my financial advisor or my wealth manager. I trust them completely. I want to take that hands-off approach. And, you know, I'm very happy with my quarterly and, and annual check-in with them. It's it's a very different way of of, of servicing your clients almost. And um, that's that's just been a really, I suppose, important, important insight that that we've been uncovering, which then links to, well, with these shifting demographics, with the rise of the female investor, with, you know, advisors getting older and, and not necessarily having this strategy in place how how do you begin to address this and i think you know laura you touched on it earlier as well around well well what about kind of the high net worth individuals what about the wealthy individuals already the other thing that was interesting is in our discussions with financial advisors their strategy at the moment for targeting you know, younger or or female clients is to rely completely on the children of their existing clients. You know, they have no proactive strategy to actually go out and try to market themselves to to a new base, which on the one hand, I suppose, if, if that works for them, great. But there are many different ways to become wealthy. Inheriting wealth is one of them. But actually, that almost then forgets about an entire other segment of females who, you know, might be at the start of their professional journey but actually in the future are going to earn a lot more money and are going to need kind of help. How, how do you actually target those? Because perhaps their, their parents aren't super wealthy and they're not due to inherit a lot of money. So there are lots of, lots of nuances and I think lots of ways in which the industry and kind of the advisors specifically have to start tackling these issues. Absolutely. And we will actually come to how uh, women can be better served uh, by financial services and, and financial advisors more broadly after this very quick break. So coming up, we look at how digital solutions are tearing up the rule book and making wealth more accessible to everyone. Coming up after this quick break, so don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Fintech Insider Insights, where we are taking a closer look at how wealth management has or should be serving women. I think we've agreed that women are not currently getting everything they need from these services. So what can be done about it? Laura, from your experience of running Financial, what sort of products and services are most important to your users and why would that be? Well, I mean, there's a segment of our users who are typically high net worth individuals who already have Typical products and services, you know, whether it's ICES and you know, the relevant tax wrappers and extra extra top ups, and actually what they would really benefit from, and we touched on it just earlier, is that extra personalised touch. You know, is someone going to help them manage their, um, you know, SEIS allowance and take advantage of that? And 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 what about um, planning for children? And what are planning for wealth transfer to children? And and what can what what can you do in that in that space? But the majority, so our user typically. Um, is a woman aged 25 to 50 and um, still got quite a lot of working years ahead of her and an and average to higher earner um, higher income taxpayer so, so certainly not necessarily a high net worth individual but possibly on the path to it and what's really interesting is they they're not looking for products and services really they're looking for um, tools to help them with certain events which we touched on so whether it be I keep hearing this thing called an ISA um, or or not really understanding that actually you've got a pension through your employer, but you can get a SIP. 
and a sip just what, what the hell is a sip to them they don't know they don't understand it and so what we spend a lot of time doing in our content is we call it like the daily light bulb moments but not making a woman feel first of all she has to learn because I'm sorry I, I really really take issue with a wider industry which is obsessed with webinars to teach women about investing and there's no equivalent for men it's it's that this is how women are going to get ahead we have to learn everything when have you heard in like you know nutrition or fitness that you have to go train to be a pt to know how to be good in the gym you know I, we've got this view that learning is great and we all want to consume content that feeds us but make it relevant and make it every day and don't make it overwhelming because as we talked about earlier the woman's busy so to go expect her to go and do a load of webinars to learn every single thing about finance it's just not, it's just not appropriate and, it, and it's not needed. It's, it's well intended, but actually we find it really important. And, you know, we, we don't do actually marketing partnerships and product partnerships and affiliates. It's something that we get asked about a lot and they will do in the future, but it's really important for us that we connect a concept with a product. And so talk about the gender pension gap, talk about how you want to feel like you are secure in retirement, talk about how you want to build wealth and watch it grow in the background. Because in our app, we have actually a monthly net worth tracker and everyone kind of stamps their net worth and the, um, once a month. And one way to do that is pension. And did you know you can put, put money into a SIP, which is personal um, pension, which is just an investment account with a pension wrapper. And when you kind of break it down like that, you end up being able to connect a customer who wants to buy a home or wants to um, have investments for children or who wants to grow their own investments and net worth um, with the right product at the right time. And then once you've kind of done that once and help them understand that automating is really, really helpful and just letting it sit in it going. The biggest decision for one of our users is to just open the thing. And once you've done it, it's just as kind of done. And actually a bit like a passport renewal or something, you probably built it up to be something a little bit more complicated than it actually is. And I feel like that's what that's what we found about what's been more important to our users. It, it's what can help me solve this problem. And then it's another thing off the list. Yeah, I mean, that's such a great point about the learning and particularly the sort of analogy around being a, a PT versus being good at the gym. Like, I think that's such an amazing point. And, and Nadine, would you say it's sort of almost about putting the services into financial services rather than focusing on products when it comes to this kind of more coaching uh, attitude to service providing? Absolutely. I think I think ultimately, you know, the entire discussion that we've been having so far, you'll notice that we haven't focused on the actual financial products per se, because like Laura said, you know, that's that's relatively straightforward. Once you actually know what are the goals that you're trying to reach, there's kind of a set number of ways in which in which you can do that. Um, I think from a product perspective, perhaps the the one that is worth calling out is is around sustainable investing, because we also know that women like to take more of a kind of values-based approach to their money and managing their money. And if something like sustainable investing is, is one of the values by which they live, then of course those types of products are going to grow in popularity and it's going to be something that that kind of women are more interested in. But but like you said, it, it is much more around the service angle. How do we how do we better serve women so that they feel like they have the information that they need to confidently take the decisions that are going to help them on their journey to achieving those different goals that that we've kind of spoken about already. And at the, at the top of the show, you were kind of outlining the landscape and talking about the sort of the old school, more analog providers versus some of the more, the more digital providers coming through. Does that sort of truly digital uh, segment of the market have more of an opportunity to kind of address the the gender disparity in wealth management do you think it's a tough one i think i think to be honest there are opportunities at both end i think it's always going to come down to who does it faster who does it better and who does it in a way that actually meets the needs of of the of the female investors that we've been discussing the one thing I know for certain, and, and this has been confirmed through kind of all of our research, and, and I think Laura has also touched on it from um, Financial, is that it can never just be completely digital. Time and time again, you know, when we are testing concepts with customers or, you know, putting potential propositions in front of them, we get the same feedback, which is love the digital tools, love the fact that I can kind of control this, but I'm always going to need 
a way to validate something or confirm something, or even if it's just, I like to know that there is someone there in case I need them. So I think that's really important. I never think it's going to be, you know, but perhaps for some people, I, I shouldn't say for everyone, but I think for a lot of people, there's always going to be that kind of need for a bit of a human touch, but with the digital services to really encompass everything that, that we've discussed and kind of provide that tailored personalized service that can be augmented by the human at key touch points when it's when it's most necessary because ultimately we've probably all been in that position if you are making a decision that involves a lot of money you do want reassurance you don't just want to press a button and and hope for the best and hope that you've made the right decision you want to be able to send to check it with someone and whether that's you know an advisor on a banking app whether that's your friend whether that's your dad or your mum there's there's always going to be that that level of of human interaction that is needed even within digital services and Laura you're you're nodding there as you say do you do you see that from your side that's actually does that skew even more to adding the human element for women over general population yeah I don't know if it skews more I feel like there's there's just more I've always talked about there's more at stake for females there's more to lose you know, there's a greater risk generally in, in uh, for a lot of women in putting more money into wealth and wealth um, creation and wealth growing, I guess. But what's really interesting is the digital services, you can scale some of these initiatives much more quickly. So what I do like about, and we, you know, Nadine referenced Sally Cortex, Ella Vest, and they were the first investment platform because they're a hybrid. So it's you can have a digital investment uh, membership and you also can have um, discounted access to US planners. And you get at least an algorithm that's built to meet a female's lifespan, which is something that the rest of the world has still not caught up on. And most pension algorithms are based on a, you know, male, uh, sorry, an average lifespan, which obviously is um, is, is too short for a female and doesn't look at the things we talked about earlier, like life events, caring needs, extra health needs that a woman may need, um, you know, throughout throughout her later years. Um, So even on a digital level, you can actually have quite a big impact if you design a product with the end customer in mind. And and 50% of your customers are female. So that's one big win that a lot of people and, and brands and, and companies can, can get if they focus in. It's not a niche. It's a big part of the population and no one's doing it well. No, almost no one's doing it well. And so, um, you know, people like, you know, I've got to say people like Pension B actually are really lean, leaning into a lot of the stuff we're talking about. They've got some really good um, stats around balancing their um ratio of females to male investors um but then i think humans buy from humans and the sums of money we're talking about is whether it's house purchasing wealth creation that way or whether it's pension pots it is in our inheritance it's the biggest chunks of money we will ever manage in our life it's bigger than a car decision about a car or, or a holiday and yet, actually, we like we don't buy a car on the internet and Amazon drop it off. Like we go and physically go into a place where we test drive it and we look at look at it. And you know, a lot of people now don't. There's still, you can buy holidays online, but actually, a personalized approach where you can speak to a human and make sure that you're booking the right seats on the plane. And this is something that is a fraction of the value of the you know pension pots and and stuff that we're talking about. And so, I think the industry is ripe for innovation and pushing the boundaries of actually what a blended and hybrid approach looks like where as you say how do people want to have chats and regular updates what in fact what do they want to be told in an update because you know, something i've read is is um it is changing and and you want to know you were a bit more conscious about well where is it who is it with like is it funding things i don't want to fund is it funding good things um what are your fees in it what value are you bring to the table and and all that can be done um a lot better i think the massive amount of a uh, massive opportunity for, for innovation in the space. Absolutely. And um, when we're talking about sort of the higher end of the wealth spectrum, so to speak, you do get typically a lot of that sort of white glove service, that personalization um, and so on. And, and you know, some of that is presented to you in a sort of status, you know, of banking at Coots and having the gold card and going to the fancy building and, you know, uh, being taken out for lunch by your financial advisor or whatever it may be. How can 
digital keep up with that so you know your your sort of pension bees or anybody else who's kind of up and coming in this space how without you know the grand building and the status uh do you kind of create the same element of trust um Nadine is this something you've you've come across in your research yeah definitely because we we've done a lot of research I suppose with people across the spectrum you know um, millennials all the way through to baby boomers. And I think, I think it's a really interesting point. And my interpretation of it is that ultimately it comes down to personalization. You know, that white glove approach, that being taken for lunch, getting a metal card or receiving a kind of personalized gift in the, in the post. It has the common goal of making someone feel like a valued customer, you know, rewarding their loyalty, hoping that they might perhaps give you more money or, um, you know, do, do something else that, that you wish for them. I think that that probably do, does still have a place amongst a certain segment of the market. But I also think to, to build on to, from Laura's point earlier, there are also so many ways in which you can recreate that white glove personalized approach through digital tools. You know, you don't have to always just rely on that dare I say it, old school, traditional approach to banking, which I think a lot of the up and coming generations perhaps don't relate to as much, perhaps purely because they haven't experienced it. Um, I think we've, we've also touched on the fact that, you know, women are particularly time poor, you know, do they even actually have time to, to be taken out to a fancy lunch and just, you know, in, in the absence of all their other responsibilities or actually is that something that might cause them even more you know oh gosh going through the checklist of everything in my head that I need to do don't really have time to be sitting here with someone who I know is just trying to you know get, get something out of me perhaps and so I think that leads to another key point which is we know that especially the millennial generation and, and, and generations to come after that are kind of more discerning than ever they're they're more critical because they have grown up in a digital world with information at their fingertips and so you can't pull the wool over their eyes you can't be sneaky in, in trying to get things out of them because they'll see straight through it so I suppose that's a very long-winded way of saying personally I, I think that a lot of that can be recreated through clever digital personalization um, and, and touch points you know key key touch points in, in a different way I think that white glove service um, Will probably always have a place for a certain a certain portion of the population, but I would I don't necessarily think it's it's the majority of the population. And to Laura's earlier point, like some of those touch points might make people underconfident or intimidated, and therefore like less likely to think of it as something that they actually want. So kind of personalization only works if it's something that you, you know your end consumer actually wants from it as well. Um, so yeah, that's. That's such a great point. Um, Laura, what's your take on that? It's so interesting. I mean, I, you know, I worked uh, for a travel tech business before we founded Financial, and then um, we once went on a trip. And as we got off um, the, got the transfer at the other end, this beautiful hotel, um, there was a glass of um, Prosecco waiting for me and um, a, a pint of cold beer for, for my husband. And I was like, he hates Prosecco. Like, he wouldn't want Prosecco. And I, it's not to be presumptuous, that it was a beer and it was a man, but it was his favourite. It was, they'd, they'd got it for him and the travel aid, it had all been sorted. They'd reached out before, you know, that, that extra like attention to detail, that personalization, even though it was, you know, that is physical, it's not um, digital. But it doesn't take a lot to actually build trust and to make someone relax and to impress someone. You just have to care what, about what's important to them, whether it's their favourite drink, whether they just stepped off a, you know, long haul flight or, or whether it's how they like to be communicated with. So, I mean, God, there's some young people that work for us and we joke about how they would never answer a phone call from someone. Like they are WhatsApp all day long. And it doesn't matter if they're a high net worth. You know, they could do, don't presume that just because you're from a wealthy family that that young person wants to be called, let alone go for lunch, you know, when they've got plans. And, it, you know, so actually how people innovate, things like communication, things like building trust, things like what's important to the customer they're going to be the ones that win in this space because um, everyone else will just be either doing what they've always done and just fingers crossed and hoping it kind of works out. Um, but I also think brand is really, really important because I think you can, if you're building the right brand, and obviously we've got the traditional legacy brands, you know, you know what Coots stand for, you know UBS, you know, the, you know, the, the big wealth managers, you understand it. 
Um, but I'd be really interested to see how these brands evolve and what they stand for because you trust a brand, even if it's not an actual individual, if you feel like they represent your values and they're going to look after you and that, that you can trust them. Um, and so obviously that's a much bigger piece that people have to look into, but that's how I think you can bring personalization and, um, and, and trust to a digital space. And it doesn't necessarily have to be with um, physical appointments and physical sessions, but just understanding that people want to know that you're looking after their needs. And if, if you do that, you'll get a customer for life. You know, you, you won't, you won't find someone making a power move. I loved that earlier when the, the younger generations are going, I'm not giving my wealth to you. I'm going to take it somewhere else. Like that's a massive stat that everyone should be keeping an eye out for. Absolutely. Um, we're nearly coming up to the end of the show, but for final question to you both, even if we're not there yet, do we think that the wealth space is at least moving in the right direction uh, to better support women in the future? Or, you know, given some of the stats and, and the, the sort of anecdotes that have been flying around, are they not even off the mark yet? Um, Nadine, what's your take? I think absolutely. I think, you know, the fact that we have Laura here from Financial, we've got other kind of companies in, in the UK, Female Invest, um, you know, globally, we've spoken about Elvest in the US. Another one that I, I follow quite closely is, is Finmarie in um, Germany or Germany. Not Germany, definitely. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Laura. Um, you know, I think there are absolutely steps being taken in the right direction. I think like with like with most innovation that's targeting a previously underserved segment, it's not something that happens overnight. You know, it's a kind of long, long journey ahead of us. But I think that absolutely, you know, Laura being on this podcast is is proof that we are taking steps in the right direction. 100%. And final word to you, Laura? Yeah, I feel like I guess I I represent the women and the users more than I feel I do industry. I, I love that... Um, with people like ourselves and, and others that are recognizing this problem and thinking, oh my God, like why are, why is it not solving it that's already in that space? Okay, fine, we'll do it. And, and that's where, where we came at it. But we absolutely take responsibility for helping a woman control what she can control. So if the industry is not going to speak properly to women, let's speak properly to women and help connect them with the industry. You know, and um, you know, you don't have to pink wash a brand. And I'm a pink brand, so I can say that. We're always, we're always pink. It was always a choice for pink and black. Um, you don't have to pink wash an investment platform to make suddenly it relevant. And that's not what Elevest does. Elevest is like a product that literally matches the needs of the woman because they're being underserved. And we don't think you need another female investment platform necessarily. We think you need the current ones to speak better to women and appeal to a broader range of women to bring them into this wealth building space and so I definitely um hope that just as we've seen in whether it's like women's football industry keeps its eye open and goes actually there's a commercial benefit to this it's not just the right thing to do it's absolutely a massive market but in the meantime I think if we can give power back to women and show them what they can focus on and normalize it you know and and make it feel like it's part of their everyday life admin list like we all have then we're going to help close that gender wealth gap, um, at least as much as we can. Fantastic. That's an amazing point to end on. Thank you so much. And that wraps up today's discussion. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining me. Where can people find out more about you and your company? Start with you, Laura. Um, you can find us in the App Store for Financial, is in the Global App Store, um, and we're on TikTok and Instagram for um, chat if anyone wants to come and, come and say hi. Thank you. Nadine? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn, so feel free to connect with me, pop me a message, happy to chat about anything and everything. Thank you. And you can find me, Laura Watkins, on LinkedIn. Uh, thank you for listening. If you like what you've heard, follow our podcast and don't forget to leave us a review. It helps to make it better and helps others find the show. And as always, if you want to join the conversation, find us on social media. Just search for 11FS or Fintech Insider or email podcast at 11FS.com. Thanks very much. Goodbye. <laughs>